Okay, so today we're going to be looking at the relationship between language documentation and language description in the sense of uh, grammatical analysis, uh, looking at how all that fits together with the work of creating and annotating and analyzing texts. So as a brief outline, I'll first explain uh, what I mean by uh, the use of the word scientific in my title there, language documentation as a scientific enterprise. Talk a bit about what the analysis of text has to do with that concept. And then uh, give some perspective on what's out there in the literature on how the analysis of text fits into grammatical analysis. And then at the end, I'm gonna give examples of my own work on a language called Bahrain and how using text from the language documentation corpus fed into my grammatical analysis there. So what do I mean by a scientific enterprise? Well, I'm using that uh, as a quote really of Paul Newman, uh, who gave a talk in 2009 at the first international conference on language documentation and conservation titled Linguistic Field Work as a Scientific Enterprise. And from the abstract, you can already see a bit what it's going to be about. Uh, Newman writes, after years of neglect in which linguistics lost sight of the value of empirical field research, new life has finally been breathed into this fundamentally important component of our discipline. But in the process, linguistic field work has ironically lost sight of linguistics. That is, if by linguistics, one means the scientific study of language. Fieldwork ideology and practice have gone askew. And goes on to say later in the abstract, in my talk, I expose the failings of these non-scientific approaches to linguistic fieldwork, field research, and set out what would be required for linguistic fieldwork to qualify as truly scientific and thus be entitled to recognition as an essential subfield within linguistics per se. In 2013, Newman gave essentially the same talk in a seminar at SOAS, that one was entitled The Law of Unintended Consequences, How the Endangered Languages Movement Undermines Field Linguistics as a Scientific Enterprise. And that abstract, it's a similar idea, following a long period in which formal theory dominated the discipline of linguistics, the endangered languages movement has revived and stimulated a keen interest in language description and empirical field research. This has been a wonderfully positive development. However, naive ideology has led to a plethora of dubious assumptions regarding linguistic fieldwork. The purpose of my talk is to challenge these assumptions and show how practices emanating from the endangered languages movement, in which really he's referring to language documentation, run counter to the tenets of linguistics as a science. Now, uh, Newman is sort of being intentionally provocative in a rather jovial sort of way. Um, and is sort of playing devil's advocate. And he's quite aware of this because in his 2009 talk, he says, first, I'm of the opinion that the basic program of the language documentation people is fundamentally unsound. And then he says, now I learned this morning, because he was attending sessions in the conference, that a lot of what I'm saying now is misunderstanding, misrepresentation, but I'll go ahead and say it anyway, so at least you can get a different perspective on it. So at some level, Newman knows that a lot of what he's critiquing is really a straw man argument, um, but yet he not only went ahead and said it in 2009, but he repeats it in 2013. And there is a wide range of issues that uh, Nguyen brings up in his talk, in both talks, um, and there have already been responses to a lot of the issues that he raised. The question and answer period in the 2013 recording of SOAS has a lot of people from SOAS, uh, like Peter Austin, Lutz Martin, and Friedrich Luca at the time, uh, giving great responses uh, to the to some of the issues I raised in the talk. And there was a blog by David Nathan, another blog by Doug Whelan, that further responds to a lot of the issues that were raised. But I want to look at just one of the particular issues uh, that Newman raised, and this is the idea that uh, the collection and the analysis of text does not have a major role in the so-called scientific enterprise. The Newman claims in his 2013 talk that working on text is not serious research. And since that talk was on video, I can play you the clip where he says this. Um, all right. And with text, the problem is the opposite. If the problem with dictionaries is that they're too small and limited, the problem with text is that people collect too many. All right. 
They, there's a misguided emphasis on collecting more and more and more texts and without, we're long far beyond what you would have the time to transcribe and analyze properly. And that is, if you do a cost-benefit analysis of doing text, what you find is text collection drains time and energy from serious research. Now, texts do have a value, but where texts are most useful is not something to be stored away for the distant future, in fact, never to be used by anyone else, but as a guide to analysis and research while you are in the field. And for this, you only need a couple of good texts. That was new in 2013. You actually said something quite similar in 2009 about the collection of texts. I can play you that. This is just a, an audio recording of what he said about texts in 2009. I just will say this about texts. Is texts are now a fad. You know, part of what you're supposed to do is record texts, which is fine collect them, uh, transcribe them, and if you ever read the estimates on how much time it takes to transcribe text, it's off the wall. I mean, it really is. Some people say, for every minute, you need an hour. One minute recording, you need an hour. And it's sort of like, somebody else says it's 20 to 1. There was one I read, it was like 9,000 to 1. I mean, the, how long it takes, we don't know, but transcribing text is a job. And one of the things we find is the law of diminishing return sets in fairly soon. That once you have done 30 pages of text, the next 30 don't teach you as much. And the next 30 teach you even less. And by the time you get to the next 30, unless you know, you're a glutton for punishment, you wonder why you're doing it. The reason to do text is not for posterity. There's no one in the right mind that's going to get a collection of text on some language they don't know and work through those texts and write a grammar or do an analysis. I haven't seen people doing it. Everybody's collecting texts, archives of the languages of the world in Indiana. It's got loads of stuff. I've never yet seen a book that's by someone that says, I wrote my grammar based on going through those texts that Carl Vogelin collected. No one's doing it. So we're just kidding ourselves. There is a reason to do texts, and that is as a research tool. You use text as a research tool because it is what opens up what you don't know. It would confirms what you think you do know. It raises all kinds of questions, and at that, and you can learn a tremendous amount working with text in the field, not putting down for some kind of archive. If there's anything worse than a data cemetery, I think it's a text cemetery. So one of the challenges in, in responding to Newman's critiques is that there's a lot of different issues conflated there uh, in that uh, polemic against text, really. Uh, it brings up the problem of unannotated uh, texts or recordings that haven't been transcribed or translated. And this, you know, as, as, is a well-known issue in language documentation. It's a methodological challenge referred to often as the transcription bottleneck. Uh, there's a number of creative approaches and new technology being developed to try to deal with this issue and get more annotation of text. It also brings up the, uh, or sort of assumes that uh, this kind of annotation can happen in the future. So doing recordings somehow means that's going to be possible to ever go back and annotate those, which of course, often maybe it doesn't happen, but of course it's possible for that to happen. And in my case, I have done recordings and then years back, gone back later uh, and had the annotations done. Uh, and it also sort of creates a false dichotomy between analyzing texts in the field versus archiving them for later as if it's impossible to do both. Um, and then the point that I really want to get at is that he seems to say that even if you do have annotated texts, if you do have your transcri transcription and translation and glosses done, that these still have a very limited use for this kind of serious you know, scientific research. And of course, Newman's view also is emphasizing this idea that scientific research is the only reason for language documentation and really has no interest in any applications of language documentation outside of that. There's a lot of different issues there, and I'm not going to try to address all of them. Uh, one potential uh, response to this kind of critique is, again, saying that while it's not all about uh, science, and that was what uh, one person on the uh, Reddit discussion board after this talk said, I'm sick of seeing linguists worship at the altar of science. And while it's true that 
language documentation is about more than um, you know studying language to understand the nature of language in general as a universal capacity for humans. The language documentation and language engagement movement has always been very much about the scientific enterprise. It's always much been about scientific discovery, about increasing our knowledge and understanding of languages of the world. Even in the Krauss paper from 1992, uh, this is very clearly stated. Krauss says, obviously for scientific purposes, it is most urgent to document languages before they disappear. And so even then at this sort of hallmark moment of the language and documentation and language engagement movement, there was this idea that we're collecting data for analysis. And the very last sentence of Krauss's paper also uh, goes back to this point of linguistic research for scientific analysis. Obviously we must do some serious rethinking of our priorities. Less linguistics go down in history as the only science that presided obliviously over the disappearance of 90% of the very field to which it is dedicated. Well, I think a more uh, helpful way to sort of respond to Newman is to query what he actually means by the word science. It's never explicitly defined. Uh, he does talk in general terms of science as theory testing, but if you look at the examples of what he gives as sort of proper scientific linguistic research, it's exemplified by the traditional analysis of grammatical structures and fields like phonology, morphology, syntax, lexicography, writing grammars and dictionaries. That is what Newman seems to be referring to as uh, science. And actually that Reddit response that said they're sick of seeing linguists worshiping at the altar of science sort of buys into this definition because then they say, as if making a dictionary or community orthography is less valuable or makes you a worse academic, which sort of buys into this idea that the only scientific thing in linguistics is writing a grammar, when of course lexicography requires analysis, it requires theory testing, designing an orthography requires a lot of analysis and theory testing is also a scientific enterprise. So these things, shouldn't be considered outside of the realm of what scientific research is in linguistics. And this was uh, Dovin's response to Newman too in a 2012 paper. In that paper, uh, Dovin's arguing that you can do scientific analysis of text that is not looking at the uh, grammatical structures in the sense of uh, the traditional lexical grammatical uh, structure of a language. So Dovin writes, the role that texts play in this revived disciplinary project, that's language documentation, still tends to be guided by a structuralist view of languages as a collection of grammatical features, with text serving to support the more highly valued documentary products, grammars, and even lexica, whose substantive generalization the texts illustrate or contain. It is only from this perspective that it makes sense to argue, as Newman did in his uh, plenary address to the International Conference on Language Documentation and Conservation in 2009, that transcribing text can be a dubious use of a linguist's time, since the returns in terms of the new lexical items and structures one encounters quickly diminishes as one transcribes. Dobrin goes on to say, I advocate an approach to endangered language texts that recognizes them as bearing meaning in ways not considered by the traditional structuralist model described above, yet shares with the structuralist position a commitment to maintaining an analytical stance. In other words, you can take scientific approach to analyzing texts that aren't about discovering new words, new morphological uh, constructions or new syntactic constructions. There's actually more to analyzing a text that can be done scientifically and for that, you wouldn't want just two or three texts. You'd want a larger collection of texts. So uh, why does Newman use the word science in this way? Presumably at some level, Newman must know that uh, grammatical analysis is not the only scientific approach to linguistics. And I can't read Newman's mind or figure out exactly why you know, this word was chosen, but I think the the effect of this word, the use of this word, uh, is that it intimidates anyone who would want to disagree with Newman's position. And this is a, a rhetorical device that comes up in Lakoff and Johnson's book, uh, Metaphors We Live By, where they are talking about uh, war as a metaphor for arguments and how that comes up in subtle ways in academic work, which is supposed to be rational, but we still use these 
irrational and unfair tactics in uh, academic writing and academic argumentation. Some of the examples I give are intimidating by saying things like clearly and obviously would suggest that anyone who disagrees with you is somehow dense and can't see what's obvious or threatening by saying it would be unscientific to do so by saying that anyone is anyone who's disagreeing with you is somehow labeled you know unscientific and so that that's the effect i think of newman's use of the word scientific here is that if you disagree with uh, newman's priorities or if you suggest that linguistics should be done in any way other than what newman is uh, the, the sort of narrow approach that Newman is suggesting, then you're automatically labeled unscientific and you have to then defend the, the scientific method that they are actually using what you're doing. So I think that's an unhelpful rhetorical device. And so I wanna drop that and get to the more substantive question that I think Newman is actually uh, trying to get at here. And the more substantive issue is whether large text collections are useful for grammatical analysis. They clearly can have lots of different uses and lots of different functions. But for somebody whose aim is to write a grammatical analysis of a language, is it useful to have large collections of texts annotated in the, in the sense of a modern um, language documentation project? And Newman sounds quite positive about this when he talks about it in 2009, in a sense. It says there is a reason to do text that is as a research tool. You use text as a research tool because it's what opens up what you don't know, what confirms what you think you do know. It raises all kinds of questions and you can learn a tremendous amount working with text. And then he comes up with this again, this false dichotomy, working with text in the field, not putting down for some kind of archive. And exactly what that means, what that looks like for Newman becomes very clear when his statement in the 2013 talk, which hopefully is, is a bit of an exaggeration but he says you only need a couple of good texts to do this. But before uh, responding more directly uh, to that claim, I want to position Newman's uh, point of view within a wider range of views that are found in the literature on field linguistics and language documentation. So Newman's view, what he's advocating could be uh, considered the traditional view that uh, Woodbury describes where linguists have equated documentation with the traditional products of linguistic description, namely a grammar, a dictionary, and a set of texts, the Boazian trilogy. But the important part here is that the relationship to each other is hierarchic. At the top is the grammar, documenting the broadest generalizations, and next is the lexicon, serving as an appendix to the grammar, and last, enough text to permit a verification of the analysis. So that's basically the view that Newman is advocating. Like do the minimal amount of text you need to be sure that your grammatical generalizations are okay. The one view that Newman cites other than his own on this point is the opposite extreme of his view. And he looks at uh, Dixon's uh, approach to this uh, in his writing about how uh, linguistic field work should be done. And Dixon's view is that the only way to understand the grammatical structure of a language is to analyze recorded text in that language, not by asking how to translate sentences from the lingua franca. So if we imagine this as you know, points of view on a continuum, at one extreme we would have Newman that says, you know, do as few texts as necessary, don't waste your time on doing more texts. And on the opposite extreme is Dixon who says, only do texts, don't get into any of those traditional elicitation things. No, that's it's not going to give you a good grammatical analysis. Of course, there's many other more nuanced views in the literature. One view that is still rather traditional but more positive towards text is the view uh, that Crowley puts down in his book on field linguistics. And Crowley points out a few areas where text can be really useful. One is grammatical expansion. You cannot expect that elicitation from English will cover all possible grammatical patterns. And it is almost certain that new patterns are going to arise in spontaneous speech. And the other is the analysis of discourse structures. Many linguists are satisfied simply to produce an account of the phonology, morphology, and syntax of the language. However, it is becoming increasingly important these days also to attempt to describe the discourse patterns of the language which show how sentences are organized into larger utterances. So we can imagine Crowley's view being 
uh, somewhat close to Newman's view, but a bit more open towards the, the usefulness of analyzing text. Another view is that expressed by uh, Evans and Dench in 2006 that emphasizes the collection of texts as the primary method of understanding a, a language, but is more sympathetic towards the, the need for elicitation in certain contexts. They write that the job of descriptive linguistics is to describe individual languages as perceptively and rigorously as possible with maximal accountability to a naturalistic corpus of data, ideally collected within a broad program of language documentation to ensure that the full spectrum of language structures are represented. The naturalistic corpus is typically supplemented by speaker acceptability judgments that can help identify structures that are rare in natural speech. In other words, do text and then where necessary, fill in the gaps with some elicitation. So they're more sympathetic with Dixon, but a bit more open to the need for elicitation. However, there are also much more balanced views that you can find in the literature. This view from Mithun in 2001, it's interesting to note first that this view was expressed before the others were published. And actually this view was expressed in a book that was edited by Paul Newman. Mithun writes, both direct elicitation and the recording of spontaneous speech are important tools, each with a variety of uses, but neither is sufficient for all purposes and much can be missed if one of them is overlooked. Bowen expresses a similar balanced view of the pros and cons of text versus elicitation. Uh, in critiquing the text only view, Bowen writes, even if most of your data comes from recorded narrative or text, after preliminary work, you will still be working through those texts with the native speaker of the language and asking questions about them. This is also a type of elicitation. And in critiquing the elicitation only view of Alan writes, elicitation will allow you to make a lot of progress, but it will bias your data towards the constructions you choose to ask about and ones that are easy to translate. Also, you can't do anything with frequency working from elicited data because their frequency is determined entirely by what you ask. Therefore, you should also use spontaneously generated data. So we see this more uh, balanced view expressed that looks at sort of the pros and cons of different approaches to gathering data and doing analysis of uh, the grammar of a language. Now, I presented these sort of as uh, a simple continuum, but actually, um, you know, our, our views can be more uh, complex and subtle than this. And it, I want to emphasize that there's, I don't think there's any reason to sort of pick one of these views as an ideological point. There's not really um, much to be gained by insisting that, you know, one particular approach is somehow superior to other approaches uh, in any sort of objective sense. Rather, each of these should be used as, viewed as methods that should be applied appropriately according to the context, the goals, and the resources available for a particular project. There's no reason to arbitrarily privilege one of these approaches over the other. And actually there's much more to this than just talking about elicitation versus uh, collecting text. Uh, Helbig writes about this in a 2006 paper uh, in what was described as stimulus-based techniques uh, which in a sense is elicitation and that you're setting up and targeting a particular uh, kind of speech, but you're also expecting people to respond more spontaneously, not through translation, but through you know, being put in a scenario of viewing some kind of stimulus and giving a description or a response to what's happening there. And Newman and Dixon both strongly advocate uh, the language learning approach to understanding a language, immersing yourself in a language as a linguist and understanding as much as possible. And so all of these are uh, different approaches to trying to understand the grammar of a language and all of them have pros and cons. Um, I haven't tried to do you know, any sort of a complete analysis, but it doesn't take long thinking about them to, to think about ways that some of these views uh, some of these methods are going to be particularly advantageous in certain projects and in other contexts they might just be not possible or uh, too costly to apply to a particular situation. Furthermore, you know, these views don't exist, th these methods don't exist in a vacuum. They can complement each other and they can be used um, in sort of a collaborative way where applying more than one method to apply to understanding 
uh, the grammar of a language is probably the ideal approach. Jalea writes about this in a 2001 paper, again in the book edited by Paul Newman, about how using both text and elicitation together turned out to have this uh, synergistic effect. And so uh, Chalia wrote, I advocate an approach to linguistic fieldwork in which text collection and elicitation are interwoven in a finely tuned and constantly modulated way. Uh, Chalia gives another number of examples of uh, what came easily through elicitation, such as identifying the phonological segments of the language, identifying what the basic case markers are, but then uh, the collection of text helped to confirm the basic hypotheses, helped to learn a lot about the vocabulary and culture, and then brings up distinctions that weren't available in the, or weren't present in the language of wider communication, and so are the, the difficult to elicit type of structures, uh, looking at uh, fine-grained differences in how tense aspect uh, is expressed in particular languages. Evidentials is a famously difficult to elicit grammatical category. I imagine that if Newman had ever worked with a language that used evidentials, he would have a, a different uh, perspective on the usefulness of text in grammatical analysis. Word order variation also can't really be done through elicitation. Complex uh, multiverb uh, type of constructions like clause, clause chaining that don't occur in the language of water communication are very difficult to try to analyze through uh, elicitation without having uh, a significant number of spontaneous uh, texts or narrations. And um, so th there's a number of problems that other people have already identified with trying to do elicitation only and a number of advantages to including text in your grammatical analysis. So I want to add to that a bit by talking specifically about uh, some of the uh, insights into the grammar of this language called Bahrain that I found through working with texts that I had done in a small language documentation project. So Bahrain is a Chadic language uh, spoken in Chad by about uh, 6,000 people. My initial work with Bahrain language was not a language documentation project. It was not even a grammatical analysis project. It was a short-term project to try to create a provisional alphabet and orthography. And so it began uh, with elicitation, going through word lists, trying to understand what the phonological segments were, and then kept growing to try to understand the tone and the morphology and uh, spacing issues and understanding how to write the language. And so that uh, data from that analysis eventually uh, evolved into a master's uh, thesis. And towards the end of that uh, analysis, I also collected seven short texts that were appended uh, to the grammar sketch, but it was really sort of an afterthought in a sense and more revealed uh, some of the areas of the language that weren't included in the analysis than it really did inform the analysis. And then I got a chance to go back to the field a couple times, but when I went back in 2017, I had funding from uh, the Endangered Languages Documentation Program for a small grant to spend a few months doing recordings transcribing, translating, and uh, doing uh, morphine by morphine classes of text for, for further analysis among other uses. We did 17 hours of recording. Uh, just over two hours of those were transcribed and translated. And the ones that I've been working with uh, in this analysis is a collection of uh, 48 texts that have morphine by morphine uh, glossing done. So that's about 28,000 words. Um, so that's not a, a really large documentation corpus. But uh, on the scale of things that are done working with previously uh, undocumented languages, especially a project done by a sole linguist, this is sort of a, a medium size uh, collection of texts, I would say. And what makes this an, an interesting case study is that I didn't start with documentation. I did pretty much all of the initial grammatical analysis through elicitation. And so I know exactly what I can find out about the language through elicitation only. And then because I did the documentation afterwards, I know exactly what I learned from the text that I didn't learn in that elicitation process. Uh, so this text collection is available on uh, ELAR for anyone who registers, all of the, the uh, recordings and annotations can be downloaded. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the workflow in creating this text just because you know, one of the, the issues seems to be uh, the cost benefit analysis of collecting texts. So this is sort of what the, the cost looked like in terms of creating these texts. Uh, most of our recordings were done in group recording sessions. Uh, 
where uh, a group of people would gather around and we would get out the camera and they would take turns uh, mostly doing uh, monologues. So um, the, the collection is a bit limited in that sense as well. But after uh, a while of working with a few uh, local people who are really engaged in this project, I was actually able to step away from the camera and the equipment and give it to other people to set up and do all of the recording. And so the amount of uh, effort that I was investing in creative recordings became less and less as time went on. Uh, and these were uh, individuals who didn't really have any access to other technology before. I don't think they even had you know, smartphones or any other kind of recording, but they were still able to, to learn these skills just by uh, you know, working alongside me and having me show them step by step what the different uh, essential elements of doing a recording were. The next step, of course, is the transcription and translation. Did that mostly in uh, Seymour or Elan. And again, this was a bit of a surprise to me once I got to the field because I really didn't know anyone from this community who had access to a computer or had ever done typing before. But after working with a particular informant for a while, uh, he became more and more interested in trying to do the typing himself and eventually took over to the point where he was doing all the transcription and translation on his own as a first draft. And so again, as time went on, the amount of effort that I had to invest in the annotation decreased to the point where I was just uh, checking the text with another speaker after he had already done a first draft and looking for any words that I thought might be inconsistent or that I didn't understand what was happening in the text. Uh, this is a look at what uh, the same more uh, interface looks like. You can uh, see in the bottom uh, right part, that quadrant, we have a transcription and a translation in these uh, time aligned segments so that the person doing the annotation can hear the, uh, the little segment of the audio repeated as they do a transcription and then a free translation in this case into French. This text, uh, the EAF file that's created is, can be imported into Flex and in Flex uh, we can do uh, annotation of uh, morpheme by morpheme glossing. And again here, because Flex has an automatic parser, the more text you collect and the larger your lexicon gets, the better the parser gets at guessing what the gloss of each of these words are. So you can basically skim through and just confirm that all of the glosses are correct. In some cases, if a word has a multi multiple different meanings, you may have to choose the appropriate meaning, but this allows you to, to check for consistency that whatever method you're using to uh, transcribe is being done consistently. And then this also allows you to search your text in a really efficient way. Uh, those files are then exported back to Elon. And uh, this is what it looks like in Elon where you have the time aligned transcription with again, all of these uh, annotations of the uh, morphing by morphing annotations that were added in Flex are now included in the time aligned annotations. Most of the analysis I did was done in Flex. Uh, we can use the concordance to do a search of your text. So in this case, I was looking for the word T and how it was used. So I went to the lexicon and said, search for everywhere that I've tagged this word in all of these texts. And it's come up uh, 295 times. And I can scroll through the 295 uses of this word. And as you click on any instance, it brings up the text where that word occurs. And you can look at the context where that word occurs and very quickly um, go through the different functions of a particular word throughout your corpus. So applying that method to uh, trying to increase my understanding of the grammar of Bahrain, there are at least six uh, scientific or uh, results, that is six additions to my grammatical analysis that resulted from analyzing text in flex. Uh, so this is the analysis of tense aspect marking, discovery of a rare type of serial verb construction, uh, my analysis of idiophones, and then a background marker, a manner demonstrative, and an analysis of the influence of the major contact language, Chadi and Arabic. So I'm going to go through each of these six quickly and try to illustrate why texts were an essential part of making these discoveries about the grammar. Uh, just to simplify a bit, um, verbs in Bahrain basically have four indicative verb forms, an imperfective, a progressive, perfective, and perfect, or at least that's what I labeled them. And the labels are uh, get at sort of what the meanings of these words are like when you talk about them really without any particular context. So either in elicitation or in, in general sort of conversation, how, how these words would most commonly be interpreted in unmarked context. So the imperfective form, Gadei, uh, would just mean he is walking. 
and it's not sensitive to tense. So you can say Tandekade, yesterday he was walking. And so the same verb form can be used for sort of this present ongoing thing or a past imperfective uh, thing that's happening. Um, but this same verb form that has this imperfective meaning in many different contexts, once you look at the use of this verb form in text, you realize that it has a different function. And this is particularly in narrative text where this shows up. The same form has a very different function. Uh, so in this text, uh, this text about uh, a folk story, tale about animals um, taking turns to hunt for each other. Um, and so as, as the narrator is telling the story about the events that are happening, the animals are taking turns going and hunting and coming back and eating. Uh, and so uh, it said, uh, he goes, hunts, uh, and then Nisei Tei, they come, eat. And this again is the imperfective form. So it's the same form that in other contexts would be interpreted as, you know, he is hunting or they are eating or, you know, they usually hunt or they usually eat. But in this context, it's, it's these are the verbs that are driving, you know, the main line of the story from event to event. These are clearly things that are being accomplished and finished in order for the story to progress. So they have a perfective interpretation in this context. And so without text collection, you don't know that uh, these particular verb forms actually have more than one function depending on the genre or the context they're being used in. And to be fair, I actually discovered this quite early on just by collecting one text, but to get at the full range of what are the functions of these different verb forms in different contexts, it's really difficult to do that in a elicitation because you don't really know what you're looking for. It's only when you have a large collection of texts with different genres, different kinds of uh, constructions where you can see what each of these verb forms can actually do, what they can actually mean in different contexts. So that full range of the use of the tense aspect forms of verbs really requires a range of texts to be able to an analyze. Another discovery was a rare type of serial verb construction. Uh, serial verb constructions to in prior motion are very common. Actually, that's what uh, these are, uh, go eat, come eat, these are serial verb constructions there in that story. Uh, and there's other serial verb constructions in the language that express manner or direction, and those are fairly common. There's another one that uses uh, the verb that means to stand, and that one um, is pretty easy to find in text. But there was a particular kind of serial verb construction that only occurred once in this entire 28,000 word corpus. And so you can imagine that something that's this rare, but yet still part of the grammar is very easy to miss and actually essentially impossible to get through elicitation. Uh, but through having a corpus this large, you're eventually able to find these kinds of rather rare parts of the grammar. Um, and so again, this is this is a folk tale of um, animal eating the child of this other mythical character. Uh, and this example is uh, the one child he takes eats it. And by going through text and seeing what was uh, happening with the morphology of these verbs, was able to see that there's something irregular going on and then able to look further into the properties of this particular combination of verbs and find that it has the properties of serial verb constructions, particular morphosyntactic properties, and include that in my grammatical analysis. But without this text collection, this would have been completely missed from my analysis of serial verb constructions. Another way I use text was to analyze idiophones. The idiophones came up a bit uh, last week in our conversation. Uh, and and texts are um, a clearly a, one good way of getting at uh, idiophones. And uh, Dingamansi has talked about this a, a bit, uh, both in his uh, PhD thesis and a later paper of uh, trying to understand how to analyze idiophones. Idiophones are, are often uh, described as a class of words that are phonologically marked. So they have sounds that are, are unusual for the language's phonological inventory or they uh, do things with expressive morphology, either in tone or in reduplication uh, or pitch that are unusual for uh, most of the words in, the, in that language. Uh, so I'll give you a quick example of an idiophone in this recording. Near the end of the recording, uh, where you'll hear a partial reduplication, a word, uh, and that's uh, the idiophone that we're looking for. <laughs> So you hear that repeated that's part of the sort of expressive marketing, the lengthening of, of this idiophone that's um, 
that's common for, for these kinds of words. However, there's a difficulty in the grammatical analysis that this kind of clear uh, marking is not present in all idiophones all the time. And there are some words that don't seem to have the semantic properties of idiophones that do have these markings. And so just making this sort of uh, superficial phonological analysis of what idiophones are and aren't fails to capture a grammatical distinction. But it's very difficult to get at the semantic distinction in any sort of objective way. So the question is, you know, what other approaches can you use to, to tease apart idiophones and words that look very similar to idiophones, but appear to have different semantics? So one way I did that was looking at frequency of words in text. And so uh, in this example, I'm looking at the number of idiophones or words that are like idiophones, but had different functions across a series of texts. And the idea here is that idiophones have uh, a function that lends to them being used more often in narrative, lends to them being used more often in folk tales because it's part of sort of the, the uh, engaging, entertaining aspect of telling folk tales. And so that's what the black lines that are represent, represents how many idiophones occur in each text, where these uh, texts that are on the left side of the chart, these are any old genre, and the ones that are on the right side of the chart, these are folk tales. So the black lines here represent that there are way more idiophones in each folk tale than there are in these other genres. In other words, you're more likely to find idiophones in folk tales and other genres. These white lines represent the words that are phonologically similar to idiophones, uh, but have a different function. And you can see this in that they, they don't become any more common in folk tales or less common in other genres, that they're rather just as likely to be uh, produced or to occur in any kind of genre. And so by looking at a collection of texts, you can see this different distribution and get at further uh, sort of a quantitative way of reasoning out uh, and distinguishing between idiophones and similar words. Uh, another way of doing that is looking at the frequency of each word throughout the corpus. So there's 125 different idiophones that occur in this corpus, but 86 of those idiophones only occur one time in the entire corpus. 23 only occur twice. And this is because idiophones have very specific semantic context. They, content, they usually occur uh, only with say one other particular verb or type of event. They, they, they're not, uh, each particular idiophone is not frequently used, even if uh, idiophones themselves are common. However, the other words that are similar to idiophones that have some of the phonological properties, but don't have the semantic properties, they have much more general meaning. And so they're used much more frequently. Each of them occur 20 to 80 times in the corpus. So looking at frequency of words throughout the corpus, how, how often each one of them occurs, helps to again, distinguish these two very similar uh, groups, uh, classes of words in the grammar. So idiophones are very hard to elicit, uh, but they are really easy to find in natural text. And the frequency can be uh, analyzed and used as a tool to separate apart uh, idiophones and similar words in the corpus, something that can't be done in elicitation. Okay, fourth one is uh, this background marker. Uh, it's a bit difficult to describe exactly what it is, um, in part because it has no counterpart in really any uh, European language or any other uh, language of water communication, and in part because it occurs in a lot of different contexts. So it's hard to sort of generalize uh, what its meaning is. In elicitation, this word is pretty rare. The only time it really ever showed up was when we were talking about identificational construction saying, you know, this is so-and-so or whatever, or presentational constructions. And then uh, this word will show up in that context. But when you look at the corpus, this is the single most common word in the corpus. It occurs more than any other grammatical word, any other pronoun or anything. This is the single most common word in the corpus. And my, uh, you know, description of this language for my master's thesis, the initial sketch, didn't describe this word at all because it was almost entirely based on elicitation. I mean, I mentioned in a footnote that this word occurs in the text and I don't understand what it is, but I wasn't able to do a description of it because I didn't have enough text to try to get at what the, the breadth of its use is and really understand uh, what the function of the word is. I did finally do an analysis with uh, uh, a mid-size corpus 
and found that you know there are at least these seven different functions uh, that this word has. I was able to get a bit about the different uh, syntactic uh, context where it occurs as well. But the only way to describe this word is to have a large collection of texts. And to leave this word out is a bit absurd because it is the most common word in the language. Another analysis I was able to do recently was the analysis of a manner demonstrative. It's a word that means like this. And that was undescribed in previous work, but I'd saw some other people working on manner demonstratives. And so I wanted to look back at my corpus and see what I could find about it. And by just look, going through the functions of this word in the corpus, I was able to do uh, a reasonable job of doing a first sketch of its uh, meaning and functions. It's a word that has multiple functions, so that's difficult to handle in elicitation if you just ask what this word means. If you ask, you know, what does tei mean, they're going to tell you it means gomsa, it means like this. But that's not very revealing in terms of what the actual functions of the word are. You need to look at how it occurs across lots of different texts and lots of different contexts to get out what its functions are. Some of the functions are rare, and so the more text you have, the more instances you have of this word being used naturally, the better job you can do uh, describing what it is. The uh, analysis of the word really needs to include a multimodal analysis because it's commonly used with uh, gestures. And so having a language documentation project that includes videos is actually really useful for doing an analysis of this kind of word. So I'll, just, I'll give you a quick example of that. You'll hear the word te and see it in the subtitles and you'll see a gesture being made as the, the speaker says like this. Uh, he's talking about hunting uh, squirrels. Drop a one kalas arka yude nta vigadena do figaro do figaro so you see a very clear uh, stabbing gesture made when he says te okay the last uh, scientific uh, discovery i made uh, by using the corpus was analysis of uh, bahrain language documentation uh, corpuses often have very valuable data on language contact and the, the language of wider communication for the Bahrain is uh, Chadian Arabic. The recordings that I, I did in this corpus were all done uh, with this sort of aim of getting uh, quote unquote pure Bahrain, uh, that speakers were asked to speak in their language. Um, and that's a disadvantage from the viewpoint of looking at it, uh, the actual language use uh, uh, of, the, of a multilingual community. So I don't have data on you know, when and how people switch between Arabic and Bahrain and neighboring language like Socorro or something else. But it's actually quite useful for understanding how much influence Arabic has had on Bahrain. So we're looking at what is the influence of Arabic or where does Arabic appear even when people are uh, in their mind attempting to speak purely in uh, this sort of monolingual set of uh, just speaking Bahrain. And in this context, we still get 5% of the corpus being uh, Arabic words or words of Arabic origin, uh, which is not a huge amount, but it's also not negligible. What you can do in a corpus is you can realize that not only just how many words are Arabic, but you can look at the distribution of these words and their frequency. And it turns out that there's a few Arabic origin words that are very common, but most of the Arabic words are very infrequent. And so that distribution looks something like this. There's say one word that occurs you know, 400 times in the corpus, a few that are in the 100 to 50 range, and then quickly drops off. And most of the Arabic origin words only occur once or twice in the corpus. This is a, a word cloud where the words that are most common are the biggest. Uh, and that word, uh, that's all, that's um, sort of a, an interjection or a discourse uh, kind of marker. It's the word khalas, khalas uh, from the Arabic to be finished. Um, and these are this is the list of the most common words. You can see that most of them are interjections or sort of these discourse markers, conjunctions, prepositions, uh, and even the ones that are announced on this list actually have a particular uh, grammatical or discourse function. So what we learned from uh, looking at that is that uh, the words that are being brought into Bahrain from Arabic are not just replacing uh, Bahrain vocabulary with Arabic vocabulary, but it's expanding the grammar of Bahrain to bring in uh, these new grammatical functions by uh, bringing in these Arabic words and using them in these functions. The loans from Arabic also confirm the morphological analysis of Bahrain verbs because they modify verbs from Arabic in order to fit Bahrain morphology, uh, where they'll just pick uh, 
the consonants and a single vowel from the Arabic word in order to fit their uh, template. So the maximal template for a Bahrain verb has just one vowel and uh, can have one consonant in the onset and up to two consonant following that. So when they create a, a Bahrain verb from an Arabic verb, they select the consonants and vowel and single vowel that will fit their template and only use those in uh, producing this Arabic word. And so this quite you know, fascinating process confirms the analysis of uh, the Bahrain morphology, the verb uh, syllable template. So those are the two things we're able to learn from uh, looking at uh, a corpus about Arabic and Bahrain. So that's my list of six scientific discoveries from analyzing texts. Uh, somebody might counter that, you know, these six things aren't that uh, significant, but I'll just repeat that, you know, this includes the analysis of the single most frequent word in the language, which seems fairly important for a grammatical analysis. Most of this work was done without access to speakers of the language. So even though the upfront cost is relatively high in creating this corpus, the cost of the actual time doing the analysis with this text away from uh, the area where the speakers live is very low cost. And that's one of the things that uh, Newman sort of claims that nobody's ever gonna analyze these materials later. But in fact, for a researcher who works on their own language documentation project, they can analyze their materials later. And this is becoming more and more common where researchers who do language documentation projects earlier on in their career continue to use that corpus to do more analysis later on. And another advantage to, uh, to doing language documentation is that you're able to continue the analysis between other projects. And this doesn't require you know, leaving your work or leaving your family for you know, a few months to go do more analysis. You're able to uh, continually working on this thing. So most of these uh, discoveries that are made in the corpus have been done uh, sort of in, in small periods of time over a month or two. Uh, broken up in that way. They don't require taking a week out of other, anything else to, to work on that project. And that again responds to another complaint of Newman that nobody really has time to get away and to do analysis of endangered languages. But if we have a corpus of the language, you actually do have time to do this in a small, smaller, more compartmentalized approach to analyzing the language. So texts are useful in grammatical analysis for things that are hard to elicit, for anything to do with frequency, which again is what uh, Bauer and said in her work in 2007. And unlike other methods like observation, texts you know, are relatively permanent. They can be shared with other people and they're multi-purpose. Uh, so just to come back to that multi-purpose point, in the case of Bahrain, these texts have been used in the Bahrain literacy program, uh, including this text that was included in a literacy book that was taken from a recording and then edited and included in a literacy book. Um, they can give insights to other aspects of the language. So um, a couple of the recordings actually reveal some attitudes about uh, literacy and doing literacy in Bahrain. So I'm currently trying to analyze and better understand what some of the attitudes that are expressed about literacy uh, that occur in the documentation corpus. And of course they have an intangible value. So the Bahrain people I showed videos to, loved watching them and it was very clear that uh, they were engaged in this. And so the clearest example of this was when we uh, was taken to record a lady named Ambaya who remembered these old funeral songs. And we record her singing these songs. And from then on, whenever we went to visit a village to sort of explain uh, what we were doing and what why we wanted to record, instead of doing a long explanation, they would just ask me to play the recording of her singing. And as soon as people saw that those songs, uh, which uh, haven't been sung for decades because people have transitioned away from their uh, traditional funeral practices towards more Islamic practices. People, as soon as they saw these you know, old songs that they hadn't heard for decades, they realized the importance of this for them and were really engaged and wanted to create more recordings to uh, capture some of that uh, intangible uh, cultural heritage that they valued. So in conclusion, among the many potential uses of a well-annotated language documentation corpus, is the ability to leverage data for grammatical analysis in ways that are not possible through other methods. And I would say that to pro programmatically reject the analysis of a large collection of texts as part of grammatical analysis is in fact an unscientific stance in that it neglects an insightful empirical method for acquiring knowledge. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, the references are available if you're interested in following up on any of those.